Eddie. Now I want to have, and we're going to have to use your cell phone too. I need your cell phone. Here's uh, Kathy. Hello. Kathy. Hello. She heard me say her name. <laughs> Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Addington. Good morning to you. Nice to see <laughs> you. Hey, Kathy. Good morning, Laura. How was Curcio yesterday? Oh, boy, do I have a story to tell about that. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> oh gosh, it, it was great. It was wonderful. Until the very end, and somebody hacked in. Oh no! This is Cassie. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Hey. Good morning.
Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good morning. A couple of announcements before we begin our prayers. One is to let you know that next week, our liturgy will be moving with, if all goes according to plan, and I think it is, moving to a, a more, slightly more formal, and with a few people, the kind of key players, the readers and a cantor in the church, distanced and masked in the church, using our new technology. Uh, I know we've now gotten comfortable with Zoom, <laughs> and what we're learning in the world right now is as soon as we get comfortable with something, there's a change. And I think this is a very positive change overall for the quality of what we're doing here at St. Peter's. For those of you watching at home, we will move to the cameras that are in the building and to the sound system coming out of our sound system. And uh, at least those of us that are leading worship being here in the space. Uh, at some point, of course, we will move to a, some more uh, in-person gatherings. Uh, I think probably sometime in September, assuming the numbers of cases uh, go down. But next week, we will be in the building for those of us that are leading. You will link from a link on the website so or from an email. It'll be a lot easier. It'll be like going to Google and clicking a link. So stay on after church for coffee hour, if you'd like, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And uh, you'll be getting some communication from us this week about that. The other announcement is that uh, we have a food drive next Sunday. Uh, canned goods, there's some information about that in our Thursday email, so please take a look at that. The other important announcement is that you may have received an email that looked like it was for me, uh, Friday or Saturday that had a link to a Dropbox file. Please do not click on that. Uh, I sent an email out last night about that. Our IT people are working on that. My own email, I'm not able to respond out to people, so he's working on that as well. So I'll keep you posted. I'm get, receiving emails, but not able to send. So please just bear with us. This is not connected to what happened earlier in the year. This is a totally different situation. It's someone that's somehow accessed at least my email to send spam. So check out the email I sent last night from the church. That is from me actually, and uh, has some information about that. Uh, so thank you all for being here today and for worshiping and for your prayers for ourselves, for the church and for the world. Returning now to our liturgy. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Together. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Joining our voices together. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. 
continuing now with the psalm appointed for today. Joining our voices together. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing life forevermore. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And now we'll hear and respond to the word of God. A reading from the book of Genesis. Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you preserve life for the famine has been in the land these two years and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest god sent me here before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and keep alive for you many survivors so it was not you who sent me here but god he has made me a father to pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have, I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked to him. Hear what the spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient, in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure. That...
understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray using the chorus of that hymn we just sang. Spirit, spirit of gentleness, blow through the wilderness, calling and free. Spirit, spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. Amen. Sorry about that light. <laughs> I promise it's not an angelic uh, <laughs> visit or anything, <clears throat> or maybe it is. While Jesus should always be surprising us, the story today breaks a mold, and it's a little disturbing, actually. The image presented in the gospel lesson doesn't quite fit with our, our idea of who Jesus is, what Jesus is supposed to say, what he is supposed to do the second part of the lesson I'm talking about now with the encounter with the Canaanite woman. And so as Matthew describes the scene, Jesus and his disciples are far from home in the region of Tyre and Sidon, out on the Mediterranean coast. In other words, they are out in Gentile country, foreign territory, out beyond the boundaries of their own comfort zone, out beyond the comfort of their own people. And as Jesus and his friends are doing their thing, a Canaanite woman comes and approaches them and starts shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Now the word Canaanite, the Canaanite woman, Canaanite is an ethnic catch-all in Scripture. 
that covers various native and indigenous people of that whole region that stretches up and down that part of the Mediterranean. And from now into now is what's Lebanon all the way down uh, to, the De to the Red Sea. Scripture tells us that the Canaanites were the first people there in that region. And eventually led by Moses, the Hebrew people arrive and form a nation, removing the people that were already there. And so by the time of Jesus, centuries and centuries later, some Canaanites were resettled in other areas of the region. Some had been integrated into the Hebrew people, and some were nomadic, wanderers. It's also important to note that Canaanite is the most frequently used ethnic term in the Bible. It appears over and over in both the Old Testament and the New Testament and it's mostly in a negative and pejorative way. It's an ethnic slur, really. And in the book of Joshua, Canaanites are included in a list of nations for the Israelites to exterminate. That's in the book of Joshua. And later they are described as a group which the Israelites in fact had annihilated, or mostly annihilated, because Jesus finds himself talking to a Canaanite woman. It's also interesting to notice, I think, more recent biblical scholarship points out that the Israelite culture largely overlapped with and is derived from Canaanite culture. So the Israelites, their culture was largely Canaanite culture. But the Israelites became the dominant group over time. And well, we sort of know what happens when one group begins to dominate another. So now back to the gospel story. People are always coming up to Jesus asking for help, especially asking for healing. So this encounter is both baffling and jarring because it's happened before and it will happen again that people come to Jesus for healing. He heals them and everyone goes about their business. In this story, he definitely hears the woman. He hears what she is saying and he doesn't answer her. Jesus ignores her request. The woman, however, is pretty fierce. She doesn't let up. After all, she loves her daughter. Her daughter is suffering. They need help. And she's not the least bit afraid to make a scene, which she does. She keeps shouting until, until the disciples ask Jesus to please send her away. She's a nuisance. And then finally, probably because he realizes she's not going to go away or give up, Jesus looks at her and patiently, I guess, explains, I was sent only to the lost house of Israel. That's not enough for the woman. She is not deterred. deterred. She gets even more desperate. As you can imagine, a mother or father would in this situation, and she falls to her knees and says, Lord, help me. And still, Jesus doesn't help. Instead, he answers her with words that cut to the bone, no matter how hard we might try to soften them. Jesus says, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. The dogs. Now, maybe there's an explanation beyond the obvious here. Maybe Jesus is tired and he wants to break from the relentless demands of his ministry. After all, in the verses just prior to these and what we've read the last two Sundays, Jesus had fed the multitude with just a few fish and some bread. And he tries to get a break and yet the people still follow him and try to get his attention. And then right after the feeding, the story from last Sunday, just before this story, Jesus comes to his disciples in a storm out on the water. And in the midst of their own fear, he reminds them to not be afraid. So maybe Jesus has just had it up to here. 
with people begging for favors. Or maybe he's just describing the reality as he understands it. His main mission being the healing of the children of Israel. And yet the woman still undeterred. She turns the slur about the dogs back at the man who insults her. And she replies, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Wow. And then watch what happens. Jesus says to her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. So what do we make of this? What do we make from our own experience of being human that might apply to Jesus' experience with that woman and the woman's experience with Jesus? I've heard it stated that it's racism, but that's not true. Racism is not a construct of the first century, first of all. It's a construct of more contemporary times of the Enlightenment. Frankly, when white Europeans began to dominate other groups, that's when racism became part of how we understand the human experience. There's not really a racial difference, but there is an ethnic difference. There's a cultural difference between Jesus and the Canaanite woman. And there are centuries of mistrust and hatred involved. And Jesus, being fully human, carries with him the baggage of his own culture, just as you and I do as well. And the baggage is often our biases. The biases we inherit from our parents and our communities, the biases we inherit from our religion, frankly, from our nations, and from our history as a human species. We know all about it, really. It's human. And Jesus, being a human, seems to have had his own biases. Biases that any first or that many first century Jews would have had in Palestine. So what does this mean for us? What does it mean for me? That's where I always start when I think about a sermon so that that I can expand it out, I hope, to all of us. I I have a story about my own cultural bias. I sort of struggled with sharing because it says some things about myself that I don't really like to think about. It doesn't exactly speak to the point here, I think, but it comes close enough, so I decided to share it. And it's pretty recent. It's from February, right before we began to shut down and before we became fully aware of the virus. I was on my way to the airport late February. I was going to the National Cathedral for a film festival on race and film. There were two films that we were going to, a friend of mine was leading this, and two of the films they were screening in the nave of the National Cathedral, one was Glory, filmed right across the river in Isle of Hope. And I'd forgotten that until the movie movie started. That was a wonderful bit of synchronicity, I think. So I was flying to Washington, D.C. for a quick trip of continuing ed and to see my friend. On the way to the airport, I realized I didn't have any more travel-sized toothpaste and no more uh, shaving cream. I needed both of those. So I stopped at Walgreens, right there on Victory, which is where I often stop on the way to the airport. Kind of part of my airport ritual. So I run in, not late to the airport, but I didn't have a lot of time. I was looking for the toothpaste, travel size, and the shaving cream. And I went to the shaving cream section, and I went to the toothpaste section, and I couldn't find them. So then I got a little irritated, a little annoyed at the layout of the store, and I didn't want to be late to the flight. And so I made a turn thinking, okay, it's somewhere else. I made a turn in another aisle, and coming toward me was a black woman. And I said to her, sounds like a question, but it really wasn't. I said, where are the travel size toothpaste and shaving cream? And she stopped as she was coming toward me. And she just looked. And then I looked. And I realized that she had a stethoscope around her neck. 
And she had a lab coat on and a name tag from Camel Hospital. You see, what I had done is I had made an assumption out of my own cultural bias. that if I'm, in, if I'm in a store and there's a black woman there, she's likely a clerk. And if she's a clerk and she's there to answer my question without sometimes even the niceties of hello, may I ask you a question? And then realizing as I would have if I'd stopped for a second that she didn't work there that she didn't have a Walgreens name tag on. She had a stethoscope and a lab coat and a Candler Hospital name badge. That's how cultural bias works, I think. At least that's how it works for me. And there are really much worse stories from my own life that I could tell you, much more embarrassing things. And that's frankly pretty embarrassing. She never said a word to me. I apologized. Not profusely, because I was embarrassed and I was a little angry. I rushed out of the, I found what I was looking for. I rushed out of the store and got in the car and I started to fume a little bit because I was embarrassed. And often what we do when we are embarrassed is we get angry. At least that's what I do. And so all the way out to 16, I started, I kept thinking about it. I made that awkward turn that I often miss to get on 16, or I did when I first moved here. And right as I was making that turn to get on I-16 to head to the airport, I remembered something else from the fall, from anti-racism training that we'd taken at our clergy conference just the fall before in October with a woman from Atlanta named Dr. Catherine Meeks, who did a wonderful job talking about these issues of bias and racism and domination and supremacy. And one of the things that she said to us, most of us white, she being an African-American woman, an academic, a leader of uh, these sorts of programs in the Episcopal Church, she said black women especially are socialized to make white people not feel bad. And she said, so I don't let people off the hook. She's very kind. She doesn't force people she doesn't shame people. She doesn't intentionally embarrass people. So when people come to the realization of their own bias or their own racism, she said, I don't say it's okay. And that's what that woman, that doctor or nurse that I encountered at Walgreens, that was the gift she gave me. She didn't metaphorically pat me on the head and say, honey, it's okay. She let me sit in it for just a minute, or a lot of minutes, actually. And it opened my eyes, once again, to the assumptions that I make about people and what their relationship is to me and what they're there for me to serve me or to answer my questions or to make me feel okay about my biases. So I share that story with you because I think it's pretty accessible. I think it's pretty common, I think, if we're willing to take a minute and see how we interact with people, especially for those of us who are white, the way we interact with black people or Hispanic people, anyone that's in a different group than we are. And especially when there's a power dynamic, like there was differential, like there was when I was the customer and this woman I thought was the clerk. Cultural biases are just part of being human. That's a fact. And we have not evolved past that. But the problem with these biases is that when they are left unchecked and when we get some power and we get in groups and the groups get power, our biases become insidious. They become racism and supremacy. And we know what happens when racism and supremacy take root. All kinds of horror. So perhaps it's when we notice the suffering of others that we can best be awakened to our own biases. I think that's what happened with Jesus. I know that's what happened with Jesus. He woke up to the suffering of this woman that he made assumptions about, that she was not worth his time, that she was not the people he came to heal or whose suffering he came to alleviate. And he woke up. 
because the woman was insistent. And so I think that's what happened to many of us in this country last May and June. Those of us who are white, especially. We woke up to something we hadn't been aware of so completely. We saw it on our TV screens. We saw it when many of us, not just white people, were afraid. Like the disciples in the boat who were afraid. And then right after that, Jesus and his friends awakened to this woman. We awoke, we awoke to the suffering of our black brothers and sisters. Ahmed Aubrey down in, in uh, Brunswick, out for a run, hunted down, and we saw the video. George Floyd in Minneapolis, a foot on his neck for nine minutes, and we saw the video. And interestingly, I think this is important to notice, the woman, Breonna Taylor, we haven't dealt with that one. The police in Louisville have not dealt with it. The city of Louisville has not dealt with it. The country has not dealt with it. It is not so much in our awareness because we haven't seen it. And yet there is a woman who was asleep in her bed, an EMT. The police made a mistake in identifying her apartment. They go in and they shoot her dead. Simple as that. So it's rough. I know it is. It's difficult. There's a lot of controversy and disagreement about all of this. But I think what the scripture shows us is that it begins with our biases that are fully human and fully natural, but they can't be normal because they that's where evil takes root. And so I think our spiritual work is to begin to examine every chance we have our own biases when we encounter someone who's different from us, to do a quick check. Did I respond in a way that I would have responded if the person was in my own ethnic group, in my own social class, in my own community? Or did I not? Did I not respect the dignity of that person, the human dignity of that person? That's the baptismal covenant. To to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. And we respond, I will with God's help. I was struck as I was sitting there listening and singing a little bit to the hymn that we just heard, Spirit of Gentleness. I was really struck by the second and fourth verses. Because I think it speaks, I know it speaks directly to what can happen when God begins to move in our lives. In the second verse, you, meaning God, you swept through the desert and stung with the sand. I was stung in Walgreens back in February. We as a country were stung back, stung back in May with the video. Jesus was stung by the woman, the Canaanite woman. And you goaded your people with a law and a land. And when they were blinded with their idols and lies, then you spoke through your prophets, the Canaanite woman, the woman in Walgreens, Ahmed, Brianna, George, all the others who help awaken us to what's going on. And Jesus, of course, who first had his eyes open and then in a much more cosmic way calls us all to open our eyes. And then the fourth verse, and I'll finish. You call from tomorrow, Jesus, God, calling from the future. You break ancient schemes, ancient biases, cultural biases. From the bondage of sorrow, the captives dream dreams. Who's dreaming now? Lots of people. Our women see visions. Our men clear their eyes. That's mostly probably right. Our women see visions. 
our men clear their eyes with bold new decisions your people that's us your people arise amen and bless us thank you Let's continue now with the Apostles' Creed. If you're following along in a printed or electronic version of the bulletin, we're on page five. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray to God who alone makes us dwell in safety. For all who are affected by coronavirus, through illness or isolation or anxiety, they may find relief and recovery. Lord, hear us. For those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. Lord, hear us. For doctors, nurses, and medical researchers, and especially those in our own parish, that through their skill and insights, many will be restored to health. Lord, hear us. For the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and the dying, that they may know, that they may know your comfort and peace. Lord, hear us. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive, thankfully, the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, enlighten by your Holy Spirit those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship you and serve you from generation to generation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, whose loving hand has given us all that we possess, grant us grace that we may honor you with our substance and remembering the account which we must one day give, be faithful stewards of your bounty. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
us now pray for our own needs and the needs of those we love and for the needs of the world. Pray for all those on our parish prayer list, for those whose needs are known by us and for those whose needs are known by God alone. We give thanks for and pray for those celebrating birthdays this week. A belated birthday for Wendy Eberly. Birthdays this week for Ann Hubbs, Karen Lindholm, Julie Lowenthal, Charlie Powers, Randy Stolt. We also pray for and give thanks for those in our congregation celebrating marriage anniversaries. Barbara and Chris Baker, Ann and George Hubbs, Anne and Chuck Kepke. I give thanks to God for 15 years of ordained ministry in the priesthood of the Episcopal Church and for the congregations I've been blessed to serve, St. Peter's, Emmanuel, St. Paul's, and Noonan. Let us give thanks to God for all the gifts so freely bestowed, for the beauty and wonder of creation, in earth, sky, and sea. For all that is gracious in the lives of men and women, revealing the image of Christ. For our daily food and drink, our homes and families and our friends. For minds to think and hearts to love and hands to serve. For health and strength to work and leisure to rest and play. For the brave and courageous, courageous who are patient in suffering and faithful in adversity. For all valiant seekers after truth, liberty and justice. For the commitment, talents and financial gifts of your people used for the work of your church. For the communion of saints in all times and places. Above all, we give you thanks for the great mercies and promises given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. To him be praise and glory with you, O Father and the Holy Spirit, now and <laughs> Amen. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may so much not seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And now before the peace and dismissal, I want to remind you to stay for coffee hour. But at the very beginning of that, I will say a little bit more about our online worship and how that'll work, uh, at least as far as I understand it right now, which is pretty much, I think, how I understand it. And so stay around for that, and then I'll give us some time. If you want to not stay around for the breakout groups, uh, then I'll give you a chance to uh, log out. So hang around after the, uh, after the postlude. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.